Let's pray. And as we pray, I want to make sure that everybody is clear. We've been talking about this Unreal series for the last four weeks now. and We've looked at our relationship with God, that vertical relationship with God. And today is where we begin to look at our horizontal relationships with each other. And so as we pray, I'm praying that what I say lands the way that I intend for it to land and that it, you would receive what God wants you to receive out of it. Amen? All right. Father, we are excited today to dive into your word and to see who it is that you are and, and know you in a greater way. So as we listen to the words that you've given this day, the word that you have for us that is new and exciting and powerful each and every day, we are ready to receive it. Till up our hearts, prepare the soil, and make us ready to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So unreal. I've really gotten a kick out of the, the little vignettes at the beginning. I was thrown off at first by the, you know, the colorations on the faces and stuff, but I've really actually started to like them. Um, and I really am excited because of today's message. Um, this is week five. We'll be talking about honoring your parents today. And it's such an important um, commandment in the Bible. And it rings true and actually has kind of a, uh, it gave me an extra hit this week. Because uh, in the last few weeks, I had a great aunt who passed away. She was 85 years old. Her name was Irene Hebron. And she was an amazing lady. And I got to speak to our family church, which is just down the road from here, and share a few words and, and, and you know, share the word of God to my family, which you don't always get a chance to do, to have everybody kind of collectively gathered and be able to give the word of God in a way that I, I hope honored Ann Irene's life. And as I, that happened, all that stuff was going on, I had this message also to kind of dive into and prepare and honoring your mother and your father and honoring your family and what does that really mean in the light of how families tend to be. Our families are not rainbows and lollipops, okay? I don't know anyone whose family is full of unicorns and everything is candy corn from the sky. We all have stuff in our family. And so that makes this particular commandment a bit of a challenge, amen? So, let's recap just a little bit before I jump in here. So, we've been talking about the Ten Commandments. And Pastor Paul has talked about the old Charlton Heston coming down from the mountain with the tablets in his hands. And this morning, I was sitting in my office in, in, in kind of preparation, and I have the, uh, a picture, a framed picture that Pastor Paul had given me of the Ten Commandments. And I just noticed today that kind of behind the words of the Ten Commandments is Charlton Heston throwing them down. And I was, la I was, I mean, I literally started to laugh so hard in my office when I realized that there he was. We've been talking about it, like the moment that, rah, where he just throws it down and the earth opens up and the, the, that they just got swallowed up because they just didn't even care what God was saying to them in the midst of their walk. And I think that's how we look at the Ten Commandments. We see Charlton Heston ready to destroy, smite me. You know, and, and that, that the Ten Commandments are some kind of, oh, God is holding me down. God is oppressing me. He's keeping me back. But really, that's not what the Ten Commandments are. And as we've been going through our vertical relationship with God, is, I hope that you've kind of understood that it's not about the things that you don't get to do. It's about the things that you get to do. I mean, in week one, we talked about putting first things first and and, 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 and in, the, in the Carlton paraphrase, I always say, you only get one God and I'm it. Okay? But see, even though it sounds harsh as a commandment, how awesome is that? That answers the question right there. You got one God. He's it. You don't get another one. Praise God. I can put my... Theolo not theology books, but I can put all my world religion books to the side because there is one God, and he's it, and that's all I get, and I can worship him, which is the second one. Don't make any graven images. Worship God only. So I've got one God. I can worship him. He's true, and I can give him worship, and that's exciting. 
Because there's nothing more exciting than worshiping God in the day-to-day work. Then the third one, don't mess with my name. Respect his name. Don't take his name in vain. However it lands for you, respect the name of God. He is the only one. You don't get another. He's the one you worship. So when you say his name, it should be, it better be an act of worship. Because if it's not, then what are you saying? You're saying, God, you're the author of my problems. Oh my God, if only my wife would do this. Oh my God, if only my kids would do this. I'm actually saying, I'm not saying, oh my God, I wish my kids would be better, or oh my God, I wish my wife would be better. I'm actually saying, God, you are the reason that my wife is this way. God, you are the reason why my children go and run around and and disrespect me. Respect his name. And number four, don't mess with his day. Respect his day. And I know how hard that is in this area. Hey, we just came out of football season. Come on. Now, look, I know that we got football people in here because during the season, it was Jersey Sunday here like every week. Okay? And that's not to say you can't watch a football game. That's not to say you can't enjoy the Lord's day because there's laughter, there's enjoyment in that. But there's other things that you get to do. You get to worship him only as the only God. You get to be with people who love him as the same way that you do. You get to go out and be his hands and feet in the life, and you get to rest. In an area where we spiral at 100 miles an hour, we drive at 100 miles an hour, we cut people off at 100 miles an hour, you actually have a day marked off for you to rest. And God said... Don't mess with it. And that is your vertical relationship with God. That is that moment where you are worshiping him and you're connecting with him and you're putting him first in every day and all of that is wonderful. And then the commandments take a turn. And it's not a turn for the worse in any stretch of the imagination. It's just a turn. And it's at that moment that we get where we are today. with our fifth principle, honor your parents. So that's your first underline, honor your parents. And this comes from Exodus 20, which we've been kind of diving through, where it says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. It's amazing when you think about it. Think about the first four commandments. I'm it. Worship me. Don't mess with my name. Don't mess with my day. But here's the thing. With this one, there's a promise on the end. So that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. In all of the talk of the vertical relationship with God and all of the commandments that he gave and how you relate to him, There is no promise. So, God, you know, there's all of these different religions. There's Buddha, and there's Allah, and there's all of this other stuff. There's Baha'i, there's Shinto, there's all of these other things. Vishnu, all of that is there. But I'm saying that I'm going to follow you and serve you and be yours, and you are my only God. Can I get a promise with that? No, you can't. In God, I'm worshiping you, and I'm giving you praise, and I'm not following after other things. I'm not creating idols in my life. I'm worshiping you only. Can I get a promise with that? No. God, your name is holy, and I would never take it in vain. I will hold myself back and recognize that I am the one, more than likely, that's causing my OMG moment. Can I get a promise with that? No. 
And God, don't you realize there's so much I can get done on Sunday. My kids got soccer. There's all of these things going on, stuff to do. There's football. I want to go here. I want to do this. You know, I can just, you know, I can catch the podcast on Wednesday. But you know what? I'm going to go on Sunday and I'm going to chase after your glory and fellowship with my fellow believers. Can I get a promise with that? Nope. Here's the promise. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. A promise. Do you know what a promise is? A promise from God. Okay, there's a difference. I can promise you something, Carlton. I might not get it to you. But when God promises, it's yours. Amen? Amen? God's promise. So what do those promises look like? The first one, long life. It's right there in Exodus 20. When you honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord is giving you. Live long in the land. My Aunt Irene was 85 years old. She was born in 1927. She went to a uh, segregated school she taught in segregated schools. She walked past people who just looked down upon her for what she looked like. They had schools in this area. For those of you who never didn't grow up here like I did, we had schools in this area where the, the, the colored kids walked in a group to school while the Caucasian kids rode on their bus by them to their school. And they threw trash at them. And they did all kinds of not nice things. But she lived through that. And she was in a church where she learned about God. And she was in a church where she learned to serve him. And his blessing upon her life led her through so many wonderful things. To the point where we were able to celebrate her life yesterday. And it was a wonderful moment of celebration. It wasn't a sad day because Aunt Irene was gone. It was a day of excitement. I mean, we even had a jam session in the middle of it. Long life. Prosperity. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. Reiterating the commandment. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has given you. I know we have a, a weird, um, you know, kind of twitch that happens in, in, in some circles around, you know, when we talk about prosperity, especially from the pulpit, when we talk about prosperity from the pulpit. But here's the deal. When you focus on God, when you put him first and you get that vertical relationship right, and you get your horizontal relationship right, there are things that just happen, okay? If you know how to relate to people, one to the other, in a way that brings your God glory and, and, and kind of makes you seem like an honorable person, things happen. You go and you talk to people, and they have been dealing with you for years, and they recognize that, you know what? hey, I'm going to help you out in this endeavor that you're working on. You can talk to people and get them to volunteer with you to go and do the work that you're doing for God because you have lived the vertical relationship with God and you've lived the horizontal, horizontal relationship with man. When you do that, prosperity happens. And it's not always about money. Sometimes it's about people giving you their time. Sometimes it's about people sharing their talents with you. But the key and the start to this is honoring your father and your mother. Number three, happiness. This is another one of those words that sometimes makes us twitch because here's the deal. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that your life is unicorns and rainbows. Okay? Stuff happens. But in your relationship with God vertically and your relationship with people horizontally, you actually get to experience a peace that other people can't understand. 
What do you mean you got laid off? What do you mean this bill is late? What do you mean you've got houses in other places and you can't sell one, but you need a place to live somewhere else? Aren't you concerned about that? Well, no, because my relationship with God says he is the only God and I don't get anybody else. And I worship him and he says that he's never going to see his seed begging for bread. And he's going to take care of us. So it might not look the way that I want it to. It may not be big screen TVs and Xboxes and computer equipment. See, I'm a nerd, so that's, the, hey, that's me, okay? It might not look like that. But God made sure in my trials and in my travels, whether I was single or whether I was married, whether I had kids or I didn't have kids, God provided in ways that I still can't figure out. That spreadsheet still doesn't make sense. But you know what? We made it through. And that is joy that God gives. It says there in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I should just stop there. Children, obey your parents. Where are the kids this morning? Sorry, sorry, I apologize. That was the moment, that was a moment, I'm sorry. This is one of those scriptures that my, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter and I talk about a lot. Because she's eight. And I love her. But, <laughs> children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you, that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Again, honor your father and your mother. This is that key moment. And then the last one is blessing. And this comes from 1 Timothy 5, 4. It says, These should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. Amen. Those are your four prom of the four promises, the four things that are there in that promise. And this is where the challenge comes in. This last one, okay, where it says there, put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. That's a challenge in some families. That's a challenge in some, in, in, in some relationships, okay? To put your religion into practice, okay? It is. It hurts. But just remember, I only deliver the mail. I didn't write it. <laughs> so what do you do in those situations where it is a challenge? What do you do in those situations where there may have been abandonment? What do you do in those situations where there is may have been abuse or there may have been problems in your relationship with your parents. What do you do in that? Well, you do what the Word says. You honor them. You honor them. And in my research, when I was looking up the word honor, we talked earlier about what honor means, and I actually I don't think I gave you the underlines for that, and it says honor is to add value and weight through attitudes and actions. I want to make sure your underlines are complete. My Aunt Irene would not like it if I left the underlines out. She was a teacher for many years. She retired as a teacher in Anne Arundel County. And they honored her yesterday at her funeral. I to make sure I dot all the I's and cross all the T's, as she would have said. So you honor them. So as I was researching the word honor... We had that definition that's there on the screen right now, but there was one that jumped out at me about what's called an honor point. And an honor point is, now we talked about this way long ago when we did the armor of God, and we talked about the shield. So if you've ever seen a shield, I'm sure at some point in your life you've seen a shield, whether it was in a movie or you're one of those buffs that has the equipment in your house you know, whatever, okay? You've seen a shield. And you know, on those really fancy shields, they had all the, 
the signatures, the, the little, little crest, the coat of arms, and all those different things. Well, on a shield, there are different sections. And each one of those sections corresponded to something. And where the crest may have been put on the shield meant something about you as a soldier. Well, right smack in the middle of the shield is the honor point. That's the point that people see when you rush out with your shield in front. That's what they see, that honor point. That's where their eyes go because they're looking to see who you are. And that honor point is your parent. In your horizontal relationship, that honor point is your parents. They are that point. No matter what, when you go out with your shield, they're there. You can't get rid of them. Okay? I just want to make sure that lands. You cannot get rid of them. Whether they wanted you or not, whether they were kind and loving or overbearing and abusive, they're still there on your shield. And it's something that you will carry. So will you carry it as a weakness? Or will that be the strength point in your shield? Because if, you're, if your family was, was difficult and it was, it, it was painful then that strength point is that you came through by the grace of God. If that family life was beautiful and loving, then the strength that you carry is that honor point on your shield. The honor point. You honor them despite of themselves. So in your notes there, you've got a couple of underlines for how do we honor so you honor them first by loving them. 1 Timothy 5.8 If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So for my financial peace, folks, we use that when we talk about how you need to provide financially for your family. But the point is, you've got to love your family in spite of. Do not let that be the point where you deny the faith. Now, in cases of difficulty and in cases of danger, that doesn't mean that you have them at your house doing all kinds of things. Let me be clear in that. Okay? However, you still love them. You still pray for them. You still at you know, reach out to them on occasion and extend the honor branch. Extend that moment and say... Hey, I really want this to be a successful relationship. I really want us to grow together. You still do that in Jesus' name. Number two is honor them by valuing them. Proverbs 23, 23 22. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. There are so many things that you learn in your life from your parents. There's so many things that you have learned in your life from your family, whether it's aunts, uncles, godmothers, mothers in the church, fathers in the church. So many things. And I wonder, how much value do we give to them? I can speak for Carlton, because I would never point my fingers out there at you, because I know you guys are all super Christian. But I'll talk about Carlton. I have not always honored those who have tried to give me wisdom. And I think if we all remember being teenagers, we probably all did that to some degree. But again, I will only talk about Carlton. Okay? So there I was yesterday in front of an entire room of people who at some point in my life had actually tried to give me some wisdom. Sometimes it landed, and many times it didn't. But what I told them yesterday is that where I am today is because of the shoulders that I stood on. Standing on the shoulders of giants. 
there are many people that were in that room that prayed for me. There are many people in that room that grabbed me when I was a kid and said, straighten up or I'll straighten you. Okay? Hey, that, that's, that's church. Okay? Especially when it's a family church where it's all cousins and aunts and uncles and stuff. They'll tighten you up in a second. Okay? That's why I always have to remember with the other parents that are here, I always ask, do you want me to correct your kids or do I just let them run? Because for me, if you say, hey, correct my kids, then that means something. I'm not going to let them go sideways. Okay? So always remember that. That's why I'm very, you know, even though I'm in the kids' room and I teach the class, we have a great time in there. And some parents have said, hey, you know what? You see them running sideways, grab them. And for those who have it, I don't. I just let them lay. Anyway, so come into the kids' room. You'll get to see some fun stuff. <laughs> so honor them by valuing them. Because that wisdom that they gave, that life that they led, no matter how little you may think they put in, it was a huge deposit in your life. Because I know a lot of times when we're looking at it as young people, it doesn't seem like they're really doing a whole lot. I'm just going to be honest. Okay? I remember being 15 years old and 15, my dad's here in the sanctuary, 15 years old and telling my mom all she did was go to work and sit at her desk. She didn't do anything else. I remember that. And I know my dad does because the consequences were tremendous on everybody. It wasn't just me, the arrogant 15-year-old. It hit my brother, nine years older, and my dad. Because my mom said, oh, you don't think I do anything around here? I'm not doing anything. So there was a lot of laundry and meals cooked and, and uh, stuff hung up and things that I didn't even, just never even landed for me. But again value. You've got to value the contribution that your parents put into your life. I think I'm being a little bit too open. I'm going to dial it back now. All right, so the third one. Honor them by forgiving them. Honor them by forgiving them. This is the one right here that I read through and looked at the scriptures and went Okay, honor them by forgiving them. Proverbs 20, 20. If a man curses his father or mother, his lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. Job 21, 23 through 25. Some men stay happy until the day they die. Others have no happiness at all. They live and die with bitter hearts. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Just as in Christ God forgave you. So no matter what, at the end of the day, we all have the same Heavenly Father. And we all have failed to make the mark. There is no one, me or my parents or any of my grandparents or great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents who can say, I did it, I was able to come to God in my own strength and he accepted me. No, not one. So if God can forgive you and call you into his family and call you into his favor, then why can't you forgive those who are around you? And let's not even talk about your friends who are around you. Why can't you forgive your parents? At the very least, they were instrumental in you being here. You would not get God's grace if in your parents' moment, they did not create you. And God reach in and save you. Honor your father and your mother. So a couple more scriptures and then I'm going to be done. 
The first one goes back to the beginning, and I didn't mention it, but it's 1 John 5, 1 through 3. And it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. And his commands are not burdensome. When we look at the commands that God gives to us, we have to remember that they are not burdensome. It is not a weight that holds you down and knocks you to your knees and you can't move because of the crushing weight of who God is. It's not like that. That's the weight we put on. That's what we do. We make it hard. We make it difficult. We make it so that we've got to do everything in our own strength or else God won't accept us. But here's the deal. You can't do it on your own. So that weight that you put on your shoulders, you put it on needlessly. God never told you to put that weight on. He never told you to burden yourself down and hold it in and crush yourself under the weight. He said, recognize that you can't do it on your own and then stand up because my burden is easy. It's light. You can walk in who God is. It's easy. His commands are not burdensome. I had one more, but I'm not sure if I want to use it. And I probably should. So I'm going to. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. It says, Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Jesus did not turn away from those whom his culture said to turn away from. He touched the lepers. He spoke with the tax collectors. He even admonished his disciples and said... Or admonish the religious leaders of the day with that foolishness. And he said, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. Again, that's the Carlton paraphrase. Go in your Bible and find the accurate quote. We're called to do the same. So if our relationship with our parents is one of, of, of strain, we've got to remember, if we claim to live in him, we must walk as he did. And that means that we have to honor our parents through loving them. We've got to honor them by valuing whatever contribution they made. And we've got to remember to forgive them as Christ forgave us. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. I don't think I adequately gave this one. So I've got a video that I want to show that I think adequately conveys this particular scripture. But if you are honest with yourself, you don't really want to become like him. You admire his humility. We all do. But do you really want to be that humble? I mean, you think it's beautiful. I think we all think it's beautiful that the Son of God would get down on his knees and wash the feet of his disciples. We think that's beautiful, but is that really the goal of your life? And is your life headed in that direction of servanthood? You're thankful that Jesus was spit on 
and abused and that he took it, but you would never let that happen to you. You love the fact that he laid down his rights, but you're going to spend your life fighting for yours and defending yours. You praise him, you sing songs, and you love him because he loved you enough to suffer during his whole time on this earth for your sake. But you're going to make sure you have fun while you're down here and that you have a good time. In short, you think Jesus is a great savior, but he's not a great role model. And I say that because a lot of times I'll, I'll give messages and, I, and it's about the character of Jesus Christ and the way we ought to follow that character and, I, and it's meant with this, hey, no, I can have this, I can have that. And I just got to stop and say, wait a second, is Jesus Christ your role model? Think this through. Is it the desire of your heart that you would be this servant and lay down your life for someone else? The crazy thing about all of this is that 1 John 2, 6 says, Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Let me read it again. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. It's not, it's not an optional thing. It's not this optional thing, well, maybe I can be a Christian and admire everything about Jesus, but my life will look nothing like his. No, John says, no, whoever claims to live in him, whoever claims to have Jesus in him, must walk as Jesus did. So it's at this moment where... that you know, this is the point moment where you say what am I going to do with what I just heard and it's a challenge for those who write messages and deliver sermons as much as it is a challenge for those who listen to sermons whether they're live like you guys are right now or whether they're looking on the internet or wherever you might hear this there comes a point where you have to make a decision. What are you going to do with what you just heard? So for me this week, as I looked over these notes and I prepared to get up here and talk to you guys, and as I thought about the lives that have been in front of me, where I had to say to myself, what does this mean for Carlton? What does this mean for me in my relationship to my parents? What does this mean in my relationship to all of you? What does this mean in my relationship to God? For me, what I took away was that, number one, like the word says, I'm going to honor my parents. Even in the midst of frustration that happens, because it will. And I'll forgive them of the things that I have carried. The same way that I hope they would forgive me for the foolishness of my life. The same way that I'm grateful that God forgave me of an even greater offense. Because I've always loved my parents. I've always wanted to be around my parents and my family. I didn't always want to be around God. I very clearly did not love Him. And so this morning, that is the question. What are you going to do with what you have heard? with every eye bowed, or every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to take this moment where we are right now and ask a question. Do you believe that Jesus came for your life? It's not about anybody else right now at this moment. Did Jesus come for your life? And if you feel that in your heart, if you feel that tug on you right now, that 
Jesus came for your life and you want to acknowledge the fact that he came for your life, I want you to take a moment and just raise your hand. And that's why I asked everybody to close their eyes because I don't want this to be a moment where you feel like, well, everybody's looking at me and I don't want people to know where my life is. If you want to acknowledge that Jesus came for your life, recognize that he did and that for you, this moment is one of intense excitement because you right now at this very moment are able to call out to him and say, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And that call can be right there in your seat. And it doesn't have to be loud enough for the person next to you to hear, but Jesus will hear you. Say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I'm sorry for the sin that I thought was so important. But I am grateful that you went to the cross for me. Even though I hated you, even though I didn't want to know about you, even though I didn't care about you, you went to the cross for me. And I ask that you would be in my life, dwell in me, Give me the words to speak because I don't, I've never spoken words before. Give me a heart for you. Give me a heart for the things of you. And I rejoice today because you are the Lord of my life. And for the first time I can say, in Jesus' name, amen. So for those of you with your eyes that were closed, understand that there are people here in this room today who have called Jesus their Lord. There are people here in this room today who are your brothers and sisters. So we walk with them as he did. Embrace one another. Love one another. And for those of us who are here this morning where this message may have landed a little hard and we may have some things that we need to go and do in our own lives or seek God in forgiveness because that time may be past, I want to pray for you this morning. So we'll close our eyes one more time. I promise I'm not going to keep you too long, but I made the message short so that we could have this moment because I needed this moment this week. And I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to pray and know that God forgives them for the sin in their life, for not honoring their mother and their father. So God, we are in this attitude of prayer, excited, knowing that you do not leave us in the realization of our sin. You said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You said that even though I'm leaving, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to return so that you can be there with me. So what that means for us, God, is that you are in heaven at the right hand of the Father and that there will come a time in each of our lives where if we go to sleep before your glorious return, you will come for us and take us to that place. But we will all go where you have prepared a place for us. And so with that, with knowing that you have called us and forgiven us, we forgive our parents. We release the pain right now and we turn it over to you. 
we release the disappointments and we turn it over to you. We release the frustration and we turn it over to you and we take up the light burden of your glory. And so when we walk to our parents and when we talk to them, we can talk to them with grace and mercy from our voice because you will give us the words to say. We can release the pain for parents who have gone on and we can't go talk to. We can embrace our parents regardless because you made a way for us and we will walk like you. And in Jesus' name, the church would say, Amen. So as we begin to go into this last song and this last bit of worship, remember what worship is. It's the singing of songs, it's the lifting of hands, it's the dancing. But it's also the giving. Because we also do tithes and offerings during our worship time. I know it's no longer at the beginning of worship. We now do it at the end of worship. But the concept is still the same. There's a God in heaven. And he asks us to live budgeted lives. And he says, each man should give as he is... Oh, each man should give. Each man should give. It's not optional. What he has decided in his heart, the decision to live a budgeted life. For God loves a cheerful giver. It's exciting. It's even hilarious. So as we prepare for this last bit of worship, and we prepare for the giving of our tithes and our offerings, Remember that there is a God in heaven and he loves you in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Carlton, thank you for that great sermon. He's got such a tender spirit, Pastor Carlton does, and uh, I just want to tell you I love you with all my heart, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, something, one last thing God put in my heart, and uh, I was watching Charles Stanley, Dr. Charles Stanley. I don't know if you guys ever watch him. He's a TV evangelist. And he said that uh, people who are givers are happy people. And I, uh, I've come to find that out in my heart. You know, it's, it's something where the Lord always challenges you. Always, uh, as a matter of fact, it's the only place the Lord says, challenge me, test me on this. But if you really want to be a happy, happy individual and giving is, is definitely the key. So we just encourage you, give with a cheerful heart what you can. And even if it's very little, God will accept it and multiply it and use it. So we thank you. And uh, again, Pastor Carlton, what a tender spirit. God's done such a work in you. And uh, I'm just glad to know you, my friend. Thank you. Cool. Cool dude. Cool dude. Cool. <laughs>